Well, as we have jumped in last week, this new series we've kicked off called Friending, we've been looking at the fact that there is great power in friendship, that God has actually designed it that way. Consider the story of a guy named Daryl Davis. In December, Davis traveled to Charlottesville, Virginia, to meet with Billy Snuffer, an imperial wizard of the Rebel Brigade Knights, which is a sect of the Ku Klux Klan. Snuffer was there with other Klansmen, attending a hearing of an associate facing a gun charge during the infamous rally that happened last August. Davis wasn't there to support Snuffer or his associates, but he did want to engage them in a friendly and civil conversation in order to understand them. His attempts to do so elicited very strong reactions from onlookers because Daryl Davis is a black man. Why would a black man want to have a civil conversation with someone who's the imperial wizard of a sect of the KKK. Well, it turns out that Davis has actually been at this for quite some time. He's a bluesman who dabbles in country as well as Western music, playing music and meeting people. He was playing in a bar in 1983, and he once was complimented by a patron who compared his playing to Jerry Lee Lewis. And after explaining to the man that Lewis actually learned his craft from black blues and boogie-woogie players, they eventually became friends despite the fact that the man revealed that he had a membership in the KKK. Well, since then, Daryl Davis has been dubbed the Klan Whisperer as he soldiers on in his mission to challenge the beliefs of Klansmen through friendship and conversation. And his closet at home is a testament to his success. It contains several Klans robes given to him by men who were Klans members but renounced their membership in the Klan and renounced racism after their friendship developed with Daryl Davis. Isn't that amazing to hear? That's amazing to hear. Well, we start a brand new series last weekend called Friending with this overriding thought, show me your friends and I will show you your future. Your friends always determine the quality and the direction of your life. As God's word says it this way in Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and you become wise But if you walk as a companion of fools, you will suffer harm. Last week, we looked at rediscovering the lost art of friendship. This week, God has something to say to us about how just one friend, just one single friend can change the course of who you become in life. We're going to consider that, but before we do, let's pray. God, I thank you that you have created us in your image. And that includes that you've created us to be relational because you are relational, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you invite us into a relationship with you, with one another. And so now, Lord, would you speak to us? What a gift that we get to have time with you through the power of your word, the presence of your spirit. Would you speak to us, Lord, about our lives, about our friends, about your friendship that you desire for us to have with you. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and grab uh, your bulletin that hopefully you got on your way in. Flip it open to this little center section. You'll see the teaching notes that are there that we'll be using throughout our time together today. And then the scriptures that we'll be digging into are there as well. Well, sociologists talk about three types of poverty, and you probably know of at least two of them, but there might be one that you maybe have never thought of. The first is material poverty, and we all know what that is, right? The second is spiritual poverty, where you might have all the physical wealth in the world and yet spiritually be bankrupt because you have no eternal hope in life. You've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 16, verse 26. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, if you're materially rich, but you lose your own soul? So there's material poverty, there's spiritual poverty, and then there's the third type of poverty that 
we might be most impacted by, and yet it gets the least amount of press. You might not even recognize it. Sociologists call it relational poverty. Relational poverty happens when we have all sorts of people that are around us. We can even be super connected on social media, and yet we feel lonely in the crowd. We, we can have a number of acquaintances or clients, classmates or teammates that would know us, know our name, maybe just know a few basic things about us, but they don't really know what's going on in our heart and in our mind. We can have this loneliness. If you've never spent time serving the global poor and you get an opportunity to do that, I want to encourage you to do that for a lot of reasons. But let me tell you, if you've never done that, this is basically what will probably happen to you. At first, when you arrive there, you will be devastated at what they don't have. You'll think things like this, like, how can they live with no running water? How can they live with no indoor plumbing? How can they live with no electricity? And then about day three or four, you're going to find something going on in you where you feel a little bit jealous. And here's why. Because at first, you'll be focused on their material poverty. But then the more you're around the global poor, you'll begin to be focused on your relational poverty. Because their material poverty creates the framework and the necessity for a relational richness that many of us don't have. Because we have all sorts of things that will occupy our time. We come home from work and we put up the garage door and we drive in and we veg out until we drive back out, maybe not even ever interacting with our neighbors. You see, our money, our comfort, our technology, those are not bad things per se, but all of them serve to isolate us. And because the global poor have nothing materially, they're forced and freed to depend on one another in this very deep and very rich community that if you ever go and serve them, you get a taste of it and you realize that maybe something's missing. Family means something to them. Neighbor means something to them. Friendship means something to them. And that brings us to the key thought that I want us to hear for this weekend, which is this. You may be one friend away from changing changing the course of your destiny. Daryl Davis knows this truth, and that's why he befriends KKK members to rescue them from the sin of racism. I hope this goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyways to emphasize and underscore it. At this church, we reject all forms of racism because God is a God that died for every tribe, tongue, and nation on the cross. Daryl Davis knows that, and so he's going and he's befriending people because he knows the power of them being just one friend away from changing the course of their destiny. We can see this clearly in one friend that God used in the life of the Apostle Paul to change the whole trajectory of his life. Let me ask you, just for a moment, I want you to think about this. What do you think God is calling you to do? What is God calling you to become? What does he want you to accomplish? What does he want you to achieve in the kingdom and for the kingdom? Well, call, uh, uh, God called Paul to preach. That, that's his sense of like, hey, I, I think God is calling me to be somebody who preaches. And then we pick up the story there in Acts chapter 9. It's in your notes. It says this, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe that he had truly become a believer. And what you need to know is that before Paul was the apostle Paul, he was named Saul, and he was known as a person who hated and actually persecuted and actually even oversaw the killing of Christians. He was an ancient day terrorist, killing people in the name of God. Until he has an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus and through Jesus appearing to him, striking him blind and eventually restoring his sight through a Christian, Saul is renamed and becomes a Christian named Paul. Paul wants to preach, but all the Christians in the area are suspicious and afraid for their safety. We get it, right? 
I mean, imagine that you meet somebody here and you invite them to come to your life group at your house and you say, here's my address, see you Thursday night. And they say, hey, listen, real quick, before I come Thursday night, you might hear some rumors that I put some of my last life group members in jail and executed a few of them. Um, If you hear that, I just wanted you to know... They're not actually rumors. I did actually do that, but I've turned over a new leaf and I'm not planning on putting any of your members or you in jail. But should I bring brownies Thursday night when I come? (laughs) And you'd be walking away thinking like, I don't know if I want that guy to know where I live. (laughs) And that's exactly what's going on here. It continues in Acts chapter 9, verse 27. It says, Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Paul wanted to preach. Paul felt called by God to preach, but everyone is afraid. So what does God do? God uses one person named Barnabas to change the course of Paul's destiny. And notice here that Barnabas had to put his own safety, his own personal safety first in getting to know Saul whenever they were in Damascus. And now he's putting his own credibility on the line to vouch for Saul. He's saying, yeah, I know what he used to do, but I've seen new life in him through Jesus. What would have happened with Paul if not for the God-given friendship with Barnabas? We don't know. What we do know is that God had a will for Paul that went right through the friendship that he helped him have with Barnabas. That it was that friend Barnabas that helped bring Saul, now Paul, along to meet the apostles so that they too could endorse and welcome him as he was preaching. And Paul, you might not know this, but he wrote over half of our New Testament and has literally impacted millions and millions and millions, it's not too much to say billions, of people. Now, I don't know what God wants to do with you, But I do know you literally could be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. Now, God didn't just use that one friend in Paul's life. He does this over and over again where you can see it in almost anybody's storyline in Scripture that God uses friends to further his agenda in someone's life. So what I want to do is I want to dig into somebody else's life, somebody named King David, and I want you to see three different types of friends that God wants all of us to have, including me and you. Now, since we talked about last week that the average American only has two close friends, most of us, as I outline these three types of friends, you're going to find one of these friends missing in your life and you're going to need to ask God to give you that missing friend in your life. So three type of uh, friends every person needs. The first one is this. Everybody needs a Samuel, a friend who makes you better. Every single one of us needs a friend who makes you better. Who is that for you? Can you think of who that person is? Let me give you the context in David's life. God had rejected Saul, a different Saul, not the Saul that I just talked about as king. And same name, but this guy was the Old Testament king of Israel. God now calls Samuel, a prophet, to go and anoint the next king. Samuel goes into the house of Jesse and looks at the oldest son, who is handsome and strong and tall, and he thought, ah, surely this is the one that God has chosen. But God says, nope, Samuel, that's not the guy. Samuel looked at the next oldest son. Okay, then surely it must be this son. And again, God says, nope. And son after son, he goes through the list. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see, the way, uh, see things the way you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
Finally, Samuel says to the dad, once he's gone through all the sons that were there in the house, are these all your sons? And Jesse replies, uh, Jesse, who is the dad, replies and says, well, they're still the youngest son, but he's out with the sheep and the goats. And so they call for him to come, and David is the youngest son. He arrives from the fields. God saw something in the runt of the family in little young David who was out tending sheep that no one else saw, and God put that now on Samuel heart so that Samuel could see what no one else saw. In 1 Samuel 16 verse 12 it continues and says, and the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there amongst his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil that he had brought and anointed David with the oil and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. What's interesting to me about this story is that not a single person in David's family saw in him what God allowed Samuel to see. You might be thinking, well, nobody in my family thinks anything great about me. Maybe you're the runt of the family. Maybe they're the youngest. I'm the baby of the family, and I'm short. God likes the youngest and shortest of the family, apparently, and I'm okay with that. God gave Samuel the eyes to see what God wanted to do in the life of David. Samuel was the one who spoke words of faith and a future into David's life. He said effectively, God is going to use you. Do you have a friend like that who makes you better? Now, I know what can happen when we talk about friendship. We can immediately think of someone like us. So if you're here and you're 16, you're thinking, well, okay, I'm looking for maybe a 16-year-old or 17-year-old. If you're 20-something and single, you're thinking, well, that's what I'm looking for in a friend, a 20-something who's single. If you're married in your 60s, you're thinking, okay, God, I, I want to have a friend who makes me better, so I'm looking around for somebody who's kind of like me. Don't let your life stage limit your friendship vision. Samuel was older than David. God loves to use a different generation with different experiences to impact one another. Fifteen years ago, as of this coming May 1st, Mark Pickerel hired me to be the young adult pastor for Christian Assembly Church. And the funny thing is that somewhere along the way, after he hired me, we didn't know each other super well. I'd gone through a few conversations and interviews, but we didn't know each other super well. But after he hired me, we were spending time together, and over the last 15 years, he has become one of my closest friends. Now, he's got 22 years on me, 22 years on me, but he's incredibly wise and a lot of fun to be around. Mark, if you know him, you've ever met him, ever had any time around him, like outside of him being up here, you know that the man oozes cool by not caring about making coolness an art form. Like he will preach in shorts and white socks and Crocs, and the Holy Spirit will come, even though his fashion is totally off, right? We know this about him. He is one of the friends that God has used to change the course of my destiny. Thank God, literally, thank you, God, that when I was 28 years old, God put a friend in my life who was 50 years old. You might be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny, and that one friend might be a bit older or might be a bit younger than you, so don't let your age limit your friendship vision Maybe God has an older friend who's been through some things and he wants you to have a friendship with that person because they can tell you a little bit about how to navigate the things you're facing. Or maybe there's somebody that God has for you who's a younger friend that you need to breathe hope and faith and life into. No matter what you need to be better at, no matter what you want to be better at, you need a friend who makes you better. You want to become better at uh, stewarding the resources and finances God has given you? You want to become better at the nutrition you put in your body? You want to become a better leader, a better parent, a better business leader? You want to have a better marriage, a better anything? One of the key ways that God will work through your life is pray and ask God to give you eyes and build a friendship with someone who is better at that thing than you are. Facts, Proverbs 27, 17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Now, friendship, true friendship, is always a two-way street. 
So God wants to use you to help make your friend better as well. It's not that you just say, hey, I want you to come make me better, but maybe God has something in you that will help make them better as well. So first, you have Samuel, a friend who makes you better. The second type of friend that God wants everyone to have is this, a friend like Jonathan, a friend who helps you find spiritual strength. David is anointed to be the next king. He ends up becoming a war hero, and King Saul uh, becomes overwhelmed with jealousy and hatred. And we pick up that part of the story in 1 Samuel 23, verse 15. It says, while David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. So it's a bad day because King Saul is now out to kill David. Now watch what happens here in verse 16. It says, And Saul's son Jonathan went to find David and to help him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, Jonathan reassured him. Every single one of us needs a friend who will help us find spiritual strength. Because no matter how mature you are in Christ, you will get tempted and you will get down. Every single one of us needs someone when everybody else is walking out, you need a friend who walks in and says, I'm with you. I'm not just going to pray for you. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to help you find strength in God. You ever have one of those days when everything is fine, but kind of nothing is fine? And you can't quite put your finger on why you just feel kind of sad or irritated or lonely or depressed or discouraged? Not long ago, I was having one of those days. I was tired. I was physically depleted. I felt depressed. I was telling myself in my mind, like, I I don't know. Is any of this even making a difference? Like, at what point am I going to do something with my life that makes a difference in somebody's life? And I just kind of was just kind of having a pity party for myself. And pastors have a higher turnover rate than any profession uh, in America except for soldiers. It's no joke. It's hard to explain if you've never been one before, but pastors get taken out on a regular basis. And there are times when you do everything you can do to try to build up and equip and and see the church grow and justice come and all the rest. And no matter what you're doing, there's going to be some voice somewhere along the way that's saying you're not doing enough and I really think this church should consider doing something about its parking or about whatever else. Like those voices are all the time on a regular basis and they're always pointing out what you haven't done, what you can't do, how someone else that they've heard of on a podcast did it better than you and the list goes on, right? And so that just kind of can be wearing. And so I was having one of those days. But thankfully, one of my friends who knows me well knew that that was the case. And so he said, hey, I I just want to talk to you real quick. It seems like you're a bit down right now. And I want to help you find some strength in God. So I shared a little bit. And I said, you know, is any of this even worth it? I mean, does anybody's life really get changed? Like, does Jesus really help people? Like, is this really, any of this count or matter in the grand scheme of things? And and he, after he gave me a moment or two and sipped his coffee for a second, he said, what do you mean is it worth it? He said, Tom, I can see how some of the haters have discouraged you, but take a look at what God is doing through you and through Christian Assembly. He said, go read the last set of baptism stories and then tell me that no one's life really gets changed. There are people gathering every Sunday in church plants that we support financially and that you help coach, that you mentor, not even counting the people who come to the CA. There are people, there are marriages that would be divorced if it wasn't for God's work through CA. There are addicts who would still be addicted. There are people who are out of slavery who would still be in sex trafficking without the work that God is doing through CA. There are at-risk kids whose lives have been literally changed. There are men who are off porn. There are people who have been sent out in ministry. There are business people using their influence for the kingdom. There are 550,000 people in Vietnam being impacted for the gospel. The sick in Kenya are being cared for. Orphans in Nigeria are being fed. The lost in Eastern Europe are being found. Revival's happening in Iran, and the gospel is going out to local high schools at a higher rate than ever before. And then he started speaking to me, giving it to me straight. It was like a pure shot of espresso, no latte, because he just started talking about God's promises. 
And he said, Tom, you need to remember that greater is he who is in you than is in the world, and you need to remember that. You need to remember that the one who has begun a work in you will see it through to the day of completion. You need to remember that God wants to do more through you than can, you can ask or think or imagine. Cling to that. You need to remember that God will work for your good in all things, Tom, because you love him and are called according to his purpose. Let me ask you, do you have a friend who speaks to you like that? Because I'm sitting down at Starbucks, and once he said all that, I just felt the words of Jesus come to me, rise, let's be on our way. <laughs> it's like, it's time to get up and go change the world, you know, it's time to get after it. And, and yet I was there just feeling so down, and he just in a moment helped me find spiritual strength. Thank you, God, for friends who help us find our strength in you. Do you have a friend like that? Or let me ask you on the flip side, are you a friend like that to someone else? If you don't have a friend like that, you might be one friend away from changing your destiny because you might be just about to give up whenever God's telling you it's time to rise up and keep pressing forward into what he wants you to be and do. And on the other side, are you a friend like that to someone? Or is it every time you get together with your friend, you're telling them all of the complaints that you have in your life? If you are always talking about all the complaints of your life, let me just tell you, you're not helping anybody find spiritual strength in God. <laughs> but whenever you come and you say, no, listen, we're going to talk about the goodness of God. We're going to talk about his promises. I'm going to remind you of some of the battles that he's already won for you. Don't rob yourself of doing that for others. I have friends that I do that for, and I have friends who do that for me. The third and final friend that God wants all of us to have is this, a friend like Nathan, a friend who will tell you the truth. David was a man after God's own heart, but he took his eyes off the Lord. He put his eyes on another man's wife and committed adultery. David, at this point in the story, was excusing his sin. He didn't really understand the gravity of it. So God sent a man, Nathan, to go and tell him the truth. And you can read about it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's a couple chapters long. And 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, you can read about it. Nathan told David a little story, a parable, to help him realize the gravity of what he had done. And God used Nathan in that little parable he told David to hold a mirror up to David. And suddenly, David was able to see what David didn't see before in his life, and he became brokenhearted before God. In fact, out of that occasion, he wrote Psalm 51 in the Bible. And this week, you can read Psalm 51 once he realized the impact of his sin and how far he had drifted from God. Do you have a friend like Nathan in your life, a friend who will tell you the truth? Proverbs 27.5 says this, An open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Let me ask you. When's the last time you had a conversation where you and a friend sat down and you said something like this? I care enough about you that I need to tell you something. What you're doing, it's not going to work. You're hurting your marriage. You're hurting your testimony. You're damaging your relationship with God. It seems like right now you care more about the applause of people than the applause of heaven. It seems like you're going to destroy your business if you do that unethical thing that you think is going to help you boost profits in the short term. This week, one of my newer friends who doesn't follow Jesus, he doesn't follow Jesus yet, um, but we've become friends, and I told him that's why Jesus put me in his life, and he was telling me about his recent adventures in snorting coke, and so he's telling me all about that, and I asked him why he was snorting coke, and he responded, and he said, you know, well, it's like you said last week, I, I, I really hadn't snorted coke in probably four or five months, but, but I was around a group of old friends, and what we do is we snort coke together, and, and so I snorted coke because of who I was with, and I looked across the table, and I said, you know what, it's time for you to get some new friends. And you just need to hear that truth. You need to hear that truth. If you don't have a friend that will tell you the truth for your own good, you may be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. Or let me flip the coin on us. Are you willing to intervene and tell someone the truth that you're friends with? Some of you are like, yeah, I do that all the time. It's not a problem at all. Okay, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> to the rest of us... 
that are relationally sensitive. (laughs) Do you have a friend that you're watching them do something that you know? You know that's not what God's good plans are for them. But you're like, ah, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to push them away. I mean, I don't want to seem judgmental. I just, I just, I just. And you're watching them inch closer and closer and closer and closer to the bad decision, to the cliff of that bad decision. Let me be a bit dramatic for a moment, if you would. Some of you will never become who God wants you to become because of your relational poverty. You show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Some of you, when you tell me about your friends, your future is going to be new addictions that you don't currently have. You aren't currently addicted, but you're hanging out with a bunch of people who are addicted, and so you're going to become an addict. And I can put you in touch with a ton of recovering addicts in this church that would say, you need to get away from that friendship now. Some of you, you're headed towards marrying the wrong person. Because your friends think he's great, even though he doesn't know the Lord, and you're afraid to be alone. Some of you are headed to a divorce that your friends are contributing to. I know a guy who used to be part of this church who's in jail now because he fell in with his wrong friends. And some of you are thinking, all right, Tom, okay, listen, you had me until the jail story. Dial it back a little bit, Tom. Like, fair enough, right? Most of us aren't headed for jail. But some of you know by looking at your friends, that what lies ahead for you is more of the same. The same half-hearted, lukewarm, I believe, but not in the way that I'm expecting God to use me to lead somebody to Christ. I mean, I believe, but not in a way for me to speak up whenever I see an injustice or to write along. I mean, I believe, but not enough for me to actually be public and go public with my faith. I mean, I believe, but not enough to be peacemaker in troubled times. See, the good news is that God can give you the friends you need, but you need to ask him. You might be one friend away from having the marriage that you always wanted, from becoming the parent that you always wanted to be, from making disciples of your children and of your children's children. You might be one friend away from moving from the obligation of giving to the joy of generosity as you trust God, from moving from prayerlessness to prayerfulness. You might be one friend away from breaking an addiction that has been in your family for generations, and you might be the very first link for a new pattern that sets generations of people free from that addiction. You might be one friend away from taking better care of your body. You might be one friend away from tapping into the God-given gifts to serve someone else in this church for God's glory. Some of you are one friend away from meeting the risen Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is a friend that will stick closer than a brother. So what do you need to do to get those kind of friends? Well, you need to do what your mom probably told you to do. To get that kind of friend, you need to become that kind of friend. And God will help you. He's looking for people, for friends that he can send into others' lives. So what are you going to do? You're going to walk with the wise so that you'll become wise. And you won't become a companion of fools because it will cause you to suffer harm. You're going to help others get better. You're going to help others grow. You're going to help others find strength in God. You're going to love them enough to tell them the truth when it's needed, but you're not going to tell them the truth until you've actually loved them. Iron is going to sharpen iron, and your life is going to count because your wise choice of friends and because how God uses you in the life of your friends. Let's pray. So God, we pray to you, the one who is known as friend of sinners. And we thank you for being a God who loves us enough to call us to be better, to leave behind sin, to leave behind pettiness, to leave behind division. Thank you for being the God who calls us and gives us spiritual strength. That you don't just tell us the truth, though you do that, but that you are the truth. And so now, just right where you are, maybe you could just say, as you think about your friendships,
First, maybe you just need to thank God. Maybe you have a friend who, who tells you the truth. Maybe you have a friend who helps you find spiritual strength in God. Maybe you have a friend who sees good in you and calls it out and helps you become better. And you just need to say thank you, God. And you need to tell that friend thank you this week. Or maybe you're looking at it and you've got two of the three friends, but you're missing one. And maybe right now you just need to say, God, I need you to reorder my friendships. I've got a missing friend. I need one that's going to make me better. To become the man or woman that you've called and created me to be. I need one that's going to help me find my spiritual strength in you. When it feels like everything's turned against me. I need one who's going to speak truth to me, even if I don't necessarily want to hear it. That their yes will make me second guess my no because I know how much they love me. God, would you fill in the gaps of our friendships? Would you give us the three types of friends you gave to David? Would you give us the friend that you gave to Paul? A friend like Barnabas that is your way of unlocking the future that you have for us. To be the man or woman that you've always dreamt for us to become and are calling for us to become. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.